Welcome to the unorthodox piece of the presentation. So this, battery, this computer here has a battery which will not last 10 minutes. Probably doesn't, it doesn't last five minutes. But the funny thing is, I'm used to it. I, it doesn't bother me anymore. When I go places, I know that I have to, to plug it in, and that's OK. And this is sort of why computing is such a safe career. People that are here, they, have no, they don't understand that in reality, what, we're, what we rely on today is already dead. It's already old hat. And so everybody who's in computing can always be sure that if you stay nimble, you'll have something interesting to work on in the future. So we love to ignore this. You know, that we, we think that we're, we're using the established technologies, we're, we're on the established platforms. But in reality, you know, all of us are using Intel-based laptops that, whose batteries will not last more than five hours. And David just thrown, the, thrown down the gauntlet and said that if you have a computing device that's mobile, it's ridiculous for it to last anything less than 10 hours. So, but we're happily using those. So we're basically here you know, uh, exemplifying the establishment. People that use computers today, that's what they expect of them. But anyway, computing platforms do move on, and newcomers, you know, the, these um, teenagers, they happily send them to their graves. So before we were born, and when uh, you know, Paul McKinney and, and David Rosling were, were busy writing code, um, the PDP-11 was the state of the art. And when we went into the 1980s, this was the state of the art in technology, right? This stuff ran Linux. Sorry, it ran Unix. Um, this, this is, this is, a, this is a, a key Unix platform, PDP-11. So what happened to the PDP-11, you know? Who remembers that? This is the computer that I started programming on. It's an Apple II. Um, it's a ridiculous platform. It's super flaky. Um, it, the first one that I got was from my, my parents, um, 1985 Christmas, and they plugged in the, the disk drive um, connector the wrong way around, and it killed the motherboard. But this, so this was like super flaky, nobody would, would touch this stuff. All the guys that were busy in you know, Paul McKinney's lab saying, these, these computers, they'll, they'll never be anything. Well, you know, uh, 10 years later, they were using these computers themselves and saying, damn, this stuff is great. It's great having a computer which I can use for myself. So 2010's cutting edge te computer technology sort of looks like this, if you look at it from the, the, from the conservative's perspective. But in reality, this is what's happening to it. So I want to start out by apologizing here and saying that you know, when I started out on this, on this Linaro thing, I was a bit short-sighted because I didn't really understand a lot about what, what, what changes were happening in computing platforms. And I thought, you know, why? I was doing this 10 minute battery thing. You know, I thought that the establishment was the future. So we started out worrying about unified kernel source trees. So David, David and I, we had this meeting and we said, you know, we have this big problem. All the vendors, they're shipping their own kernel sources. And I'm like, man, this, this is the problem that we, we need to solve. How are we going to do that? And so we've basically thought for a year and a half about how to solve that problem. You know, we have to solve this unified kernel source trees. How do, we put it, how do we work on that? Do we put them all together? You know, do we forget about upstreaming and, and, and produce these baseline branches every once in a while and so on? And while we were worried about that, reality happened. The truth is that ARM will be the new mainstream. And so while we can be busy fixing this thing about producing this thing, unified kernel tree, which is definitely an important part of that, you, we're, we're missing the big picture, which is that ARM will be the new mainstream computing platform. And this is the real thing that we need to focus on. So for those of us that are not as, as nearsighted as I am, you guys have seen this for a long time. So this is not actually news for most of you guys. I didn't see this when we started out, but this is actually not, not, not super news. But the question is, how much of the open source world is mired in the same vision that I had? You know, that's, you know that these, these computers here, that this is what Linux was for. This is what, this is the computers that people were supposed to be using. So I don't think that the open source world is ready for that yet. And so we need to help people figure that out. How do we make open source support what computing in the future will be in order to keep all these platforms, all this work that we're doing relevant? So the big questions for people that are in open source today should look at it. If ARM is going to be the new mainstream, what pieces are missing? You know, what's not there in, in, in Linux and open source? that will support ARM in that movement forward. Because if it's not there, then Linux won't be part of this new mainstream. Then something else will be the new mainstream. And if we can agree on what the important pieces that are missing are, then the big question is, how should those pieces look? And we've touched on lots of those. I mean, one thing which is nice about having this unified kernel tree 
uh, perspective is that it's sort of a proxy problem for making ARM the new mainstream. All these people are innovating on ARM platforms, building these crazy devices, um, and really pushing the software to the things that it's not prepared for. So in solving this problem about putting the kernel trees all together, we have first-hand experience of where people are innovating there. So those are the questions for me. What pieces are missing in open source to make ARM the new mainstream, and how should those pieces look? And that's basically what I want people to think about this week. So some of the problems for this connect. There's this crazy thing around Big Little that's going to change the way that we think about computing and NSMP. So up to now, we thought about multiprocessing as lots of cores in a system through which you can split threads up or split applications up and give a little piece to each of those cores to process. Well, now we're going to turn that into a slightly you know, weirder world, you know, world where they're like SMP meets LSD. And so some of these cores are not the same as others. And finding a way to handle that in software is really important. Um, so David and George touched on this thing around task migration. Task migration is a really interesting hack. It's basically saying, if you have two pairs of CPUs, and those pairs of CPUs have different capacities, can you, and, and, and also different power character characteristics, can you shift, can you make the system think it's still running on just two cores, but you shift the underlying implementation of that so that you adapt to workloads in a really efficient way. It's a really smart hack. Beyond that smart hack is figuring out how do you build a computing system that can really take advantage of these cores that have different capacities. It's a much harder problem to solve. Um, and the first one, while it's a, it's a bit of a hack, it's a really interesting hack. It's a really nicely done hack. So things that we'll touch on are scheduling and power management in general. How do you handle that movement? How do you handle powering down those cores? Do you power them down independently? And so on. These are things that um, David's touched on in his power management slide before there. Um, testing open source. I even wanted to put this in, in, in quotes because this is really like the black arts. Nobody today knows how open source is really tested. It's tested in lots of different ways. Vendors are testing these platforms internally because they're shipping this to their customers. And so they have to bear the onus of providing something which has quality. Um, the open source community tests because they put new software on their hardware and they reboot it and it stops working and they complain. Um, and so we need to figure out where does Lenaro insert itself in that, in, 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 that, in that world there. So if we know that people are doing lots of dog fooding on one end and people are doing a lot of customer focused testing on the other end, if we're the guys that are focused on building a platform for tomorrow, how should our testing be done? You know, what sort of level of quality do we expect on each of those stages there? Um, unifying, finally, this unified memory management problem that we set out a year ago to solve. So we said, you know, all these vendors are doing um, memory management differently because that's, they, were, they were each born in their own little Galapagos island. So each of them has figured out, okay, my GPU looks like this, this is what my system memory looks like, so I'll just engineer a solution for that. And we've looked at the wider problem and said, okay, all these platforms have a common set of goals that they, that they want to reach. And We've produced what we think is a blueprint for them to work together. And we had the first piece of that accepted into the mainline kernel, which is the MA buff. And that's, you know, it's a really significant step there because now we're at a point where we have this unif we have a piece of, of metadata, of, of infrastructure, which all the different kernel components can use. So we finally are able to have something which you can share memory across the kernel in a standard way. Um, so solving that, now, you know, figuring out how we actually get from these blueprints to something which is a running product is the next, next phase in this, in this um, problem solving that we're going through. And finally, figuring out what A15 and, and V8 will mean um, in a world where ARM is the mainstream, where it runs on servers, on things which look like desktops, and of course on mobile devices as well where it excels today. So people that are new here, may not be so familiar with it. I'll just go over this quickly. So we have tracks and themes for our connects. Um, this is basically just a way of grouping things and just looking at what are the interesting things that are being solved um, in Linaro today. And you can section it up based on what you care about or what your area, uh, area of expertise is. And I'm going to go over each of those and mention who the lead for that, uh, for that track or theme is. And when I do that, you should stand up. 
so that people know around you, you know, as a tech leadership, people around you should know who to talk to if they have questions or they want to go to sessions or know more about it. So starting out with the kernel. So uh, the kernel tech lead is a guy called Deepak Saxon, who used to teach uh, mathematics for primary school students, I think. <laughs> or something like that. Why are you in front of a chalkboard? I think that's what I was giving a talk at uh, one of the group. This is a great shot. OK, so the kernel in general is focused on solving this problem around consolidating kernel trees. But as I said, this is kind of a proxy problem. You know, This is like looking at the implementation detail of what the real problem is. So things that they're going to focus on this week. Next generation storage. So pieces of, of silicon are going to come out that are going to require software that is handling store, the storage APIs and, and storage interfaces to behave differently. So we're, we're going to run a storage mini summit. This one is today. And we're going to look at technology which is coming up and what needs to happen in software to support that properly. Um, there's this big surprise that we're going to hear from John Stultz um, on Friday, I think, which has something to do with Android and the mainline kernel. I don't know exactly what it is yet. So figuring out how we solve one of these big pieces of unconsolidated tree, which is all these Android patches, which, people, which everybody um, carries today. That's another thing which the kernel team is going to be working on this week here. Um, we're going to talk between the R maintainers. As I said, you know, we have this really diverse community, and a lot of people in there are really important because they're maintaining you know, like um, first class consumer shipping platforms. We want to strengthen that community, get these guys talking and talking about what the next things that they're that they're focusing on, what their infrastructure challenges are, so that we know what to focus on and what pieces that we need to provide. And finally, this to already two plus year efforts around device tree. So figuring out where is the light at the end of that tunnel. So we're, we're not, we don't know where that light is yet, but we need to figure <laughs> that out here. And I'd like to do that this week. I'd like to come out of this week saying exactly where the light is so that we can all chase after it. Okay, tool chain. This is Michael Hope. A guy whose surname is Hope, you should never underestimate. It. So Michael's always very understated about what he wants to do. Um, his focus is to improve GCC performance and now to tackle this new thing, KVM, um, which is going to be really important as we move into the server space and QMU because those two things also converge and we've done a lot of work in the past there. And also develop a benchmark. So, this guy here. Go and see this one. You bastard. Okay. <laughs> So this guy used to be the manager for the Patriots up to this weekend. Okay, so Jesse's um, very bravely actually, well, I guess that would be braver than taking on Patriots management, wouldn't it? Um, has taken on sol solving this memory management mess. And so when, when we ran these sessions for the first time, I'd go in there and my brain would bleed out of my ears after like 15 minutes because people were talking about things which I'd never heard of in computing. And I, I, I have no <laughs> ambition of actually understanding by the time I'm, I'm David's age and through with computing. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. So, work with me, come on. Okay, so things that we want to sort out this week around memory management is what the display and video APIs that are using DMA buff actually look like. So how are we going to use this thing in the kernel? We have this great abstraction, nobody actually uses it for anything. So now we have to figure out how those interact, we sort of think we know how that works, but actually designing that is what, what I'd like to see us progress towards this week. And one area which is interesting to me in particular, GPU testing and, and introspection. So when we started out I said, why is there no GPU talk? Why do we have a top for the CPUs? But the GPU is so important in the system, and you know, NVIDIA and Imagination and Vivanti would like us to think that GPU is really important. Why is there no tool which t shows us what the GPU is doing? That's such a, such a glaring omission there in terms of tools. So figuring out what activity is happening on the system, and, I, and I, it is a hard, it's a harder problem to look at than CPUs from, from some angles. So visualizing activity there and figuring out how to do that across multiple platforms where you have these binary blobs involved. Um, multimedia. So one thing which um, Tom Gall, who once was mayor of a small town, and that's not a lie. True story, isn't it? See? True story. Okay, so we've asked them to uh, lend the mayor into solving one of the bigger problems around um, 
Linux on ARM. And Zach will tell you about how big a problem multimedia actually is. But this connect here, we're going to talk about audio enablement for real now. So up to now, uh, Tom's going to is going to shame all the vendors in saying that all these platforms that we've shipped up to now have shipped basically with broken audio since Lenaro has started. And so Tom's going to look at, among other things in multimedia, how we change that situation, how we turn that situation around. And in particular, how we enable advanced features, which today the SOCs provide. So I don't know, crazy stuff like Dolby um, 5.1 um, mixing and and things which I, I don't understand a lot about because I just use headphones on an Android phone here. Um, but people that are thinking about doing more complicated things with Linux on open source, so televisions, cars, and so on, they'll, they'll want to care about this. Um, another thing that we're also looking at is Android audio and the convergence of Android audio with mainstream Linux audio. So how do we make things, features that we're working on in mainstream Linux apply to Android as well so we don't keep on reinventing these stacks all the way to the top? And finally, looking at future areas for neon work. So we started out with this big deficiency in neon. We, we, we knew that there are lots of places where we should be using the neon um, capabilities of the processor, but we never got there. And now is, we're actually at a point in time where it's time for us to broaden out our ambitions there and look at future neon work across more than just that subset of codecs that we started out with. So this guy here, if you haven't heard of Zach Pfeffer, you've certainly heard him at least. <laughs> so Zach wrote, did the slide first, and he only had that first line there. And I, I decided I, I need to give it a bit more of a, a qualified term. So if Zach had his way, what really would be happening is that he would, that team would be taking over the world. So if, I can't let Zach really take over the world because you know, governments and, and armies would get involved, but you know, just one step down from that, what could we give Zach that would make him happy? And so Zach says that he wants to see complete enablement on all member platforms. That means that he should be able to, at any time, spin an Android image which supports all the devices and all the peripherals on an SOC and play Angry Birds on that. So in order to achieve that, he's going to look at multimedia integration challenges, which are really the hard problem. Once you get past basic kernel enablement, the real hard problem in Android is how do you, you know, tie together all these different pieces of the SOC and make that actually work. And he has this controversial um, session called Binary Blobs Attack, in which he's going to talk about why binary blobs are worse than smoking for your health. Finally, and this is, this is what I care more about, um, it's basically providing the Android community with this hinge point, with this place where they can all come together and talk about problems and share um, solutions. Android is a real, really fragmented space, in part because there's so much momentum and acceleration happening behind it. Um, so we have a lot of people that are doing enablement work, bug fixes, and new feature work across you know, this wide spectrum of people in, in open source and Android communities that are you know, focusing on solving their own little problems. And we want to pull them all together and you know, provide people with this place where they can submit their patches, where we can provide them with an upstream channel because we care about Android as a common platform, as a base there. OK, power management. Amit's done a really good job at pulling together um, all these people here that care about the kernel scheduler. And this is such an important piece because I think it's the one place where you know, everything we're doing and everything the kernel community are doing really don't line up. So we've, from the beginning, we've, we've really pushed hard on, on you know, addressing this issue that SMP power management on ARM was really done in a fragmented, non-uniform way. And we've been trying to, to hit on that for how long, Amit? Two years now? Two years trying to do this? So Amit's done a great job here in pulling together people that can actually make decisions on this and try and, and show them what's special about ARM and what's special about ARM in the future as well. So if SMP ARM was hard, let's talk about Big Little or a asymmetric um, MP in the future. And that's a much harder problem to solve. Um, Amit's team has also put a lot of work into consolidating subsystems. One of the pieces that we're working on is CPU idle. This has also been a thread that's been going on for a long time. And every time we think that we're undoing that, another, another piece of plumbing that needs to be consolidated shows up. So getting a proper plan around CPU idle that people can attach dates to is what I'd like to see out of this month here. And thermal is in a similar situation where thermal for ARM and thermal for Intel mean very different things. So figuring out how much of those things can be made common and how much we can innovate in ARM separately is, is one of the focuses for this week. 
So, two to go, platform, um, Ubuntu and beyond. So if, if working with uh, Zach is one of the most uh, stimulating and draining experiences <laughs> that someone can go through, working with Ricardo I think is one of the most pleasant ones because he's always, he always can find a way to get you and him to find what the common ground is and, and how to work together on that. So Ricardo's taken on the task of really extending validation of Linaro images and through that telling people how much that platform enablement actually works. And it's been the first team that's put together you know, end-to-end -end tests in different areas there and actually seen that running on images. So today you can run tests and see, is Wi-Fi working on that platform over kernel upgrades? Is Bluetooth still working, working on that platform or over kernel upgrades? Which is a really important part of this wider testing story, which is enablement testing that I want us to focus on first. Um, Michael Hopes from the Toolchain team has done all this homebrew stuff and is covered in New Zealand. We would like to move that into a system which is more reliable and which people can actually deploy their, themselves and see how the Toolchain benchmarking and, and uh, validation is done so that you can reproduce those um, tests yourself. And so Ricardo's also working on figuring out how to make that thing into a real product that people can use inside Linaro but also deploy independently. And finally, <laughs> Deepak's gotten tired of, of these face-offs between him and all the tech leads around figuring out what it means to maintain a Linaro kernel product, and so he's bravely handing that off to Ricardo, um, who's going to help us solve this problem and figure out why, why do we have a kernel branch? What is that for? How do we maintain it? Do we keep stable branches or not, or so on? So if you care about that subject there for your platform, for your distribution, or for your the hardware you'll be shipping in a year from now, talk to Ricardo as well because he'll be, the, he'll be the guy to pull that consensus together. Finally, Paul Larson, this is what Google Images thinks you are. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, good, good uh, Christmas gift for Paul, a camera. Using lava everywhere. Um, we've put all this effort the last year and a half in producing this infrastructure which you can run automated tests on all these boards. And this is an example of David Piggott under, you know, Paul's supervision has been putting together there. And we need to now figure out how is this thing actually going to help make open source better. So using Lava everywhere um, and making it easy to use, which are basically, I think, two convergent goals there. We really want to make it so that everybody in all the working groups finds it a no-brainer to add a test for this thing that they're working on at the moment. And today that's not the situation, but it's easy. We're at the point now where it's easy to provide that if we focus on that specific problem there. So very soon I'm going to go around and tell people that every commit that we do in Lenaro has to come with a test change in it. So if we, if, when I do that, you're going to have a heart attack. So, Think about that heart attack in the future and how, how, how tough that's going to be to handle with, with family and friends and work backwards. What could lava provide me that would avoid me having this medical situation in a year's time? Okay, that's it. So enjoy Connect. I want you all to feel really welcome. Um, this Connect, I think, is special because we really do work together on things. We really are interested in open participation. Even if you're dialing in through this crazy... <laughs> this. <laughs> idea that Steven has about remote participation that's giving him like the heebie-jeebies. Um, even if you are connecting through Hangouts, do, do provide input. Do say, I don't agree with that. This doesn't work in my case here because this is really meant to be an open forum and we do welcome that participation there. Make the most out of this opportunity. Don't do what the Patriots did this weekend. You know? Seize this, this week here. Address the technical challenge that we put out. Um, build consensus where it's missing. There's a lot of places where we don't agree on things. Um, we should agree on things more at the end of this week than when we got into. And welcome each other into the community. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks for coming.